last decade, uh, and particularly during the Reagan presidency, a number of issues have been raised that uh, may indeed concern law students, uh, such as uh, fairness, justice, and the legitimate role of government. Uh, and I believe that these issues uh, surface at a time when, when we have numerous problems that threaten um, our future as a free nation and a prosperous nation. And the, the symptoms of these problems are manifested by um, high real interest rates. And any economist worth its salt will tell you that high real interest rates means that the future is not worth as much. Uh, high unemployment in some segments of our society, high unprecedented and growing uh, deficits, um, growing uh, national debt, and I believe a set of circumstances for the first time in history for runaway inflation and, of course, runaway government. And I note that I refer to these as symptoms uh, rather than causes of our problems. And if I can just say what I think are the causes of our problems uh, in a summary fashion, and I'll talk about it a little bit more. I think that the basic cause of our problem is a is a departure from the principles of freedom that made us a rich and prosperous, a rich nation in the first place. And these principles of freedom were embodied in our nation through the combined institutions of private ownership of property and free enterprise or capital. Now, through numerous successful attacks, uh, private property and free enterprise are mere skeletons of their past in our country. And uh, Thomas Jefferson, uh, he anticipated this and he said, or he predicted, that the natural progress of things is for government to gain ground and for liberty to yield. And we see that government is gaining ground. One way to look at how government is gaining ground and liberty uh, yielding is to look at what's happening to taxes and uh, federal and government expenditures. The only way, I, only way you can look at taxes, or at least one very, very important way you can look at taxes, is to see taxes as government claims on private property. That's what taxes are, government claims on private property. And indeed, if you if government taxes private property at 100 percent, would confiscate uh, private property. And indeed, taxes are going up, uh, and spending is going up. Matter of fact, spending is a much more useful way of measuring the impact of government on our lives. Let's look at spending for just a second to look at uh, to see how it's growing. In 1902, expenditures at all levels of government federal, state, and local levels of government, uh, totaled $1.7 billion a year. And in that year, the average taxpayer paid $6 a year, paid $6 in federal, state, and local taxes. Today, federal expenditures alone are over a trillion and a half. Local governments spend more than a trillion dollars. And the average taxpayer today pays $8,000 a year in federal, state, and local taxes. Now, what does this mean? Well, it means that as time goes on, you and I own less and less of our most valuable property, namely ourselves. Uh, that is, um, the average American must work for from uh, January 1st until May 8th, and is increasing by a day or two each year, to pay federal, state, and local taxes. Now, what does that mean? What's the heart of that? Well, that means that you work that period, uh, and you do not have rights to decide how the fruits of your labor will be used. Somebody else decides how the fruit of your labor will be used. And keep in mind that a, a working definition of slavery is a set of circumstances where you work all year, and you do not have rights to decide how the fruits of your labor will be used. It will, be, it will be determined by somebody else, and it will, in fact, belong to somebody else. So it turns out that we Americans uh, 
uh, if you want to look at it narrowly, we might be one-third slaves increasing by a day or two every year. Now, in the, in the economic sphere, the founders or the framers thought that relatively free markets, or what is called capitalism, uh, or non-interventionism, was the most effective social organization for the promotion of individual freedom. And indeed, capitalism is defined as a system wherein individuals are free to pursue their own interests. That is, individuals are not forced to serve the purposes of other people. There is voluntary exchange. There's private property rights held in goods and services. And indeed, we see that much of the original intent of the United States Constitution and much of the debate about the, some of the principles of the United States Constitution was to bring about this kind of, uh, to bring about a climate in which this kind of social organization could uh, occur. Now, many times the, uh, the virtues of the free enterprise system are demeaned, and uh, perhaps in the nowhere more demeaned than on college campuses. But the, the great benefit of the free enterprise uh, system is that through private ownership and control, it minimizes the capacity of one person to coerce another person. And additionally, and just as important, is that the coercive powers of the state are minimized. That is, the powers of the state are limited to what I consider to be the legitimate functions of the state in a moral society, and that is, the one legitimate function of the state is to protect you and I from international thugs confiscating our property. So that means that we should have national defense. Another legitimate function of the state is to stop domestic thugs from confiscating our property. Um, and so that says at some level we should provide uh, uh, police services. Then there's adjudication of disputes, enforcing constitutional order, and the provision of certain public goods. Now. For the past half century in our society, free enterprise and what it implies has been under unrelenting attack. Americans from all walks of life have demonstrated a deep and abiding, somebody's trying to get the door back there. Uh, Americans from all walks of life have demonstrated a deep and abiding contempt for private property rights and individual freedom. And I believe that free enterprise is threatened today, not because of its failure, but because of its success, uh, somewhat ironically. That is, capitalism has been so successful in eliminating the traditional problems of man, the historic problems of man, such as disease, pestilence, gross hunger, and poverty, that all other human problems appear to us to be at once inexcusable and unbearable. The desire by many Americans to eliminate these so-called unbearable and inexcusable problems has led us away from the basic ideals and principles upon which our nation was built. In the name of other ideals, such as equality of income, sex and race balance, orderly markets, consumer protection, energy conservation, just to name a few, we have abandoned many personal freedoms. The primary justification for the attack on private property and economic freedom, and privacy, I might add, can be found in people's desire for government to do good. That is, we all hear things like, government should care for the poor. Government should help the elderly. Government should help college students become educated. Government should help failing businesses. Well, it's all well and good to say that government should do this. But we must recognize that government has no resources of its very own. And what I mean by that is that all these programs to help deserving college students or failing businesses, 
Uh, they don't represent congressmen and senators in Washington or legislators at your state capitol reaching in their pockets and sending the money out. That's what I mean when I say government has no resources of its very own. Moreover, there's no tooth fairy or Santa Claus giving them the resources. Now, so when you recognize that government has no resources of its very own, that forces you to recognize that the only way the government can give one American citizen one dollar is to first, through intimidation, threats, and coercion, confiscate that one dollar from some other American citizen. Now, some of you might say, well, gee, yeah, well, this terminology that Professor Williams is using, intimidation, threats, and coercion, is just too loose. Well, you have April 15th to check me out. <laughs> that is, you can tell uh, the, uh, the agents of, of uh, Congress, namely IRS, that you don't want your earnings going to bail out failing uh, banks. You refuse to give your earnings to farmers. Give it to them so they can give it to farmers. You will see all the intimidation, threats, and coercion that you want to see. And if you act too ugly, you will get shot. Now, a lot of people say, well, wait, wait, you get shot. Well, that's like, I mean, I tell the people in Washington, look, you're not going to, I'm not going to give you any money to give to the farmers. And they say, well, we're going to take your house. I say, no, you're not going to take my house because I bought that house. And then uh, they come around and take my house, and I'm up at the window with guns. And they'll shoot me, they'll be armed. Uh, now, the government, government does those things, and many of us support government doing those things, for which, if a private person did them, he would be condemned as ordinary common thief. Uh, for example, I could see some homeless lady downtown, uh, Charlottesville, or in downtown Washington, and I could walk up to Don Boudreau with a gun in my hand. I could say, give me your $200. I'd take his $200. And then, having taken his $200, I could go downtown and buy that lady on the grate some housing, some medical care, some clothing. If you were members of a jury, would you find me guilty of a crime? I'm sure you would you'd find me guilty of theft. Regardless of the disposition of Don's money, I'd nonetheless be guilty of theft. Now, I ask you, is there any conceptual distinction between that act and where the government comes up to me and says, William, you know that $200 you made last week, that you had planned to buy some Lafitte Rothschild Bordeaux wine or some Chateau de Kim Sauterne, you will not do that with it. You will give it to us, and we will help the lady on the grade. We will give the money to the lady on the grade to buy her some housing. I assert that there is no conceptual distinction between those two acts. And if you press me, I would say that the only distinction is that the first act, where I walked up to Don and took his $200 to help the lady <coughs> downtown, that is illegal theft. And the second act, where the IRS walked up to me and took my money or intimidated me, that would be legal theft. But nonetheless, theft all the same. Now, I know all of you are law students and you're somehow enamored with legality, but I'm not. <laughs> that is, in a moral society, legality should not be our talisman. Because, indeed, many things in this world are legal but clearly immoral. Apartheid in South Africa was legal, but it was immoral. Slavery in the United States was legal. Did that make it moral? The Nazi persecution of Jews, the Stalinists and the Maoist purges, they were all legal. But they were clearly immoral. Now, so we have to, if we want a just society, and I'm quite sure that all of you would say that you wanted a just society, we have to ask questions about morality. And the moral question I'm asking you to think about is, can one make a moral case for confiscating the property of one American and giving it to another American to whom it does not belong? That is the moral question. That is one moral question. Now, in a free society, 
We want transactions or relationships between people to be voluntary. And we want to minimize involuntary or coercive uh, uh, behavior. A matter of fact, another interesting way I like to look at it, because a lot of people get hung up, they don't fully appreciate voluntary and involuntary exchange. I like to think of, I tell people, I love seduction, but I'm against rape. Now, what is seduction? What is the essence of seduction? Well, seduction is where, it's a kind of transaction where we proposition our fellow man in the following way. We say, if you make me feel good, I'll make you feel good. That's seduction. I love seduction because you, both parties come out feeling better in their own opinion. And that would be an example of seduction would be where I walked up to my grocer with a $2 in my hand. I say, look, if you make me feel good, give me that gallon of milk, I'll make you feel good, give you $2. And we call that a positive sum game. Both of us are better off. Now, rape, on the other hand, is the kind of transaction where we proposition our fellow man in the following fashion. We say to him, if you don't make me feel good, I'm going to make you feel bad. Bad belief, those are like adverbs. <laughs> um, now that would be where I walked up to the grocer with a gun in my hand, and I say to him, unless you make me feel good, give me that gallon of milk, I'm going to make you feel badly, blow your brains out. And in, in a involuntary exchange or rape, it is a zero-sum game. That is, in order for one person to be better off, of necessity, somebody else has to be worse off. Now, widespread private ownership and control over property is consistent with seduction and the minimization of rape. Widespread government ownership and or control over property is consistent with rape maximization. That is, government, all the world, including our government, is the major source of organized rape. Uh, and you just think of many examples, one that uh, especially touched me. May back in 1959, I was driving a taxi cab in Philadelphia, and I was making $400 a month. I mean, you get in my cab, I could give you information to buy anything that you wanted at any time. And I was getting uh, well compensated for that. <laughs> and, uh, and I got a letter in the mail, and the letter essentially said, Williams, you'll stop making $400 a month and begin to make $68 a month. And normally people don't switch in that direction. <laughs> so it requires some coercion so, or intimidation. And the letter said, unless you make us feel good by being in our army, we're going to make you feel badly by putting you in jail. You can think of many cases of, of, of rape by the government. Now, now, despite, I should add, that despite the bigness and the alleged power, I say alleged power, of industrial giants like IBM, AT&T, Exxon, Chrysler, in a free market, what kind of power do they have over you and I? They don't have any power whatsoever. That is, ask ourselves, because there's a lot of demagoguery on college campuses where you know, they say these corporations have a lot of power. But ask yourself now, for Exxon to get one dollar out of me, what must happen? I must voluntarily get out of my chair, voluntarily get into my car, voluntarily drive down the street, and voluntarily drive up this man's lot and give him a dollar for a gallon of gasoline. Now, that does not describe our relationship with government. Government will get money from us whether we want to give it to them or not. Now, but however, I would not be responsible if I didn't say that corporate giants like AT&T, Chrysler, and Exxon, they can get dollars from us whether we want to give it to them or not. But first, they would have to go to Washington. They'd have to get permission to take money from us by the United States Congress and the Senate. Uh, and we take Chrysler. Uh, when Lee Iacocca was having trouble some years ago, he's had similar troubles now. Or take the farmers who are having trouble. Now, you know, the farmers and Lee Iacocca, they know where I live. I live in Valley Forge. They can knock on my door. They could say, buddy, I'm having some trouble. Can you spare a dime? Can you help me out, Williams? Now, I'd probably tell Lee Iacocca or the farmers to go play in the traffic. <laughs> <laughs> and they, they, 
they kind of know that. And so what the farmers do, they will go to, say, Senator Dole. And the farmers will say to Senator Dole, if I ask Williams to voluntarily help me out, he's going to tell me to go play in the traffic. So could you use your agents to take his money? Now, so that's what I mean when I say that businesses can get dollars from us whether we want to give it to them or not, but they don't do it in a free market uh, uh, context. That is, they go and get the totalitarian, of course, the powers of the Congress and the Senate. Now, the free market, the free market and voluntary exchange are roundly denounced by today's defenders of what I call the new human rights. These defenders of the new human rights, that is, people who you hear talking about human rights, most of the times, they are the chief supporters of reduce rights to profits, reduce rights to private property. They are anti-competition and pro-monopoly and pro-control and pro-coercion by the state. Um, of course, these people have what they call, what they call, good reasons for their behavior. But every tyrant that has existed in history has had what he's considered good reasons for restricting the freedoms of others. Many of these people in our country who are pro-control, pro-coercion, they, you hear them, calling for industrial planning, economic planning. Now, what is economic planning? Or what is industrial planning? I'll give you a de definition of economic planning that will last you the rest of your life. Economic planning is nothing more than the forcible superseding of somebody else's plan by the powerful elite. That's all that it is. I mean, for example, I might plan to buy a Honda automobile the powerful elite will say, Williams, we're going to supersede your plan through tariffs and quotas because we think you ought to buy a Chrysler. Or my daughter might plan to work for the hardware store guy for $2 an hour. He thinks it's okay. She agrees to it. I, as her parent, agree to it. And the powerful elite will say, Williams, we're going to cancel that plan unless it transpires under the terms that we select. Now, they do all this, the do-gooders, they do all this in the name of good. At least they say they do it in the name of good. But do-gooders fail to realize that most good in the world is not done in the name of good. In fact, if you were to ask me, if you say, Williams, what's the noblest of human motivations? I'd say greed. Greed is wonderful. Now, people say to me a lot of times, well, Williams, uh, since you're talking young people, can't you kind of temper that a little bit? Can't you say, instead of greed, uh, enlightened self-interest? Something like that. I like greed. You can use enlightened self-interest if you like. But when I say greed, I mean the most no the noblest of human motivations is people trying to get more for themselves. I'm not talking about robbing and stealing from people. But I'm saying people try and get more for themselves. Uh, <clears throat> let me give you an example of virtue of greed. You see it all over, but let's, let's make it explicit. That is, you know, you see Texas ranchers. Texas ranchers, they're going out, taking risks, having cold weather, uh, trying to bring uh, feed to their stray cattle in the snow. You find Idaho farmers getting up in the morning uh, to, uh, you know, and the bugs biting them and you know, planting potatoes. And the Texas ranchers and Idaho farmers, they're doing all these things so that people in New York City can have beef. So that beef will get to New York City. And the Idaho farmers, uh, they make these sacrifices to get up in the morning so that New Yorkers can have potatoes on the shelves. Now, why do you think they do that? Do you think it's because they make these sacrifices because they love New Yorkers? 
Now, they may hate New Yorkers, but they get that beef and potatoes to New York. Now, I would surely be worried if I were a New Yorker if the beef and potatoes coming to New York depended on love and human kindness on behalf of the Texas ranchers and the Idaho uh, farmers. Let me give you another example of greed or self-interest. I've often said, you know, during the energy uh, crisis in our country, as a matter of fact, government manufactured energy crisis in our country, you know, you had little uh, uh, advertising, little kids on TV saying, don't be foolish, save some energy for future generations and things like that. When I see these advertisements, I felt like throwing my ashtray in the TV. <laughs> now, I've told a lot of people this, and they say, Williams, don't you care anything about future generations? I said, no. <laughs> <laughs> now, you know, I haven't changed anything about future generations. And so, a lot of people are disturbed, like you might be. They say, well, William, how come you don't care about future generations? And I say, what have future generations ever done to you? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, let's look at it. I mean, there's some kid going to be born in 2050. What has he done for me? Now, if he hasn't done anything for me, how then am I obliged to do anything for him? I mean, where is the quid pro quo? Where is the contract? Where is the consideration, as you guys would say? <laughs> now, however, if you watch my behavior, my behavior would belie that sentiment. That is, if you came to my house in Valley Forge, I'm nice spread in Valley Forge, several acres. You were seen several years ago, maybe six or seven years ago, I, in, I took $200, $200. Instead of spending that $200 on, let's say, three or four bottles of Chateau de Chem, Sauterne wine, that I could have fully enjoyed by myself, selfishly, consumed totally, I bought little seedlings, plant trees around my property. Now, when those trees reach their full maturity, I'll be dead. There'll be some 20, 50 kids swinging in my tree. I made extensive repairs on my house, additions on my house, that will outlive me. The guy who put on the roof said uh, my, uh, that the roof is going to last until 2035. Now I'll be dead. I've made extensions. My wife has uh, uh, made extensions uh, to our house and the deck and kitchen. And you know, there'll be some 20, 50 kids tracking mud in my kitchen. <laughs> now, why did I do these things? At least part of the reason is, the nicer my house is, the longer my house will provide housing services, what? The higher the price I get for my house when I go to sell it. By pursuing my own selfish interest, I ensure the availability of a house for some kid 2050. Now, ask yourselves, would I have the same incentives if the government owned my house? Or would I have the same incentives if there were a 75% transfer tax when I went to sell my house? In other words, anything that would change the, that would attenuate my private property rights to the house would create disincentives for my doing this socially responsible thing, namely, conserving on society's scarce resources. So, what you want to always do, if you care about future generations, you want to uh, enforce and strengthen uh, private property rights. You know, I, I'm looking at the audience, I'm uh, looking at all of you, you look like nice people, and some of you might be concerned about the extinction of the elephant, the bald eagle, uh, the whale. Uh, you know, think about this. You know, I saw, I was 35 years old. I'm, I'm 56 years old now. I, just, I know I don't look it. <laughs> but I was 35 years old when I saw my first bald eagle. And I was looking at the critter in the cage. And I was asking myself, could I have gone another 35 years without seeing him? <laughs> and I said yes to myself. But, but different people have different values. So, uh, but any, you know, uh, you hear of clubs. People have clubs to save the eagle. 
to save the whale. Uh, they're worried about the extinction of some uh, duck, uh, or uh, worried about some extinction of the owl, spotted owl. And so I sit in my office one day, you know, I was listening to this, uh, this commentary on, on people worrying about things becoming extinct. And by the way, 94% uh, of everything that has ever lived on Earth is now extinct. So, so what's 94.5 or whatever? whatever it's been. Anyway, yeah, I was listening to all this concern about people, you know, even having clubs, whale clubs, duck clubs, things like this to stop the extinction of various animals. And I said to myself, how come there's no pig club? I mean, I was listening to some animals that people not, not, don't care anything about, but they're very bad animals. Now, how come no chicken club? How many, when's the last time you've seen people in a tizzy about chickens becoming extinct? But I mean, there's an estimated, I believe, something like 5 billion chickens in the United States right now. Um, then, you know, uh, there's no cow club, no sheep club. Now, what's the characteristic about these animals where nobody's worried about them becoming extinct? And these animals that people are in tizzy about. Well, it turns out that the animals that people are not worried about becoming extinct, they belong to somebody. It is in somebody's private vested interest to make sure that the chicken survives. It is in nobody's private vested interest to see that the whale survives. That is, nobody's wealth is at stake with the whale. But people's wealth is at stake with chickens. So if you care about the extinction of various animals, you want to uh, promote uh, private ownership of these animals. In other words, what I'm trying to tell you is that in a free market, one's personal wealth is held hostage to his doing the socially responsible thing, conserving on society scarce resources. Now, despite the virtues of the free market, and never mind the fact that it was with the rise of capitalism that brought better treatment to women, better treatment to racial minorities, better treatment to the handicapped, better treatment to the criminals, better treatment to, I have down here, insane, I should be politically right, correct, uh, the hand, men, mentally handicapped or the mentally uh, challenged. There is considerable hostility towards the market. Uh, social reformers say that the market does not work. Well, maybe one of the reasons is that the market does not work because it's not allowed to work. Um, because there's government intervention in the market. And most government intervention is either the form of taking the property that belongs to one person and giving it to another to whom it does not belong, or it is in the form of denying privileges to one person and giving them to another. And privilege granting is an activity by government that dates back uh, far beyond the Dark Ages when guild and mercantile associations with a payment to the reigning lord could get the right to live at somebody else's expense, that is, have monopolies. Well, in modern times, we have the equivalent of the guild and mercantile association. There's just not a payment to the reigning lord. We just give, what, political contributions. Almost every group in our nation has come to feel that the government owes them a special privilege or a favor. And so-called conservatives in our country are by no means exempt from the practice. Um, matter of fact, that's what you work on all the time in your, in your law courses. That's what you're going to come out in, as law. Uh, students and as practitioners, you're going to specialize in privilege granting and confiscating the property of one and giving it to another. Manufacturers, for example, they feel that government owes them protective tariffs. Farmers feel that government owes them, owes them crop subsidies. Organized labor feels that government should keep their jobs protected from competition with those who are not union members. Intellectuals, college professors, feel that government should give them funds for research. College professors love to get poverty funds to do, uh, you know, $500,000 grants to do studies on poverty and have meetings in Miami at a nice hotel in the winter to talk about the poor. The unemployed and the unemployable feel that government owes them a living. Almost every occupation, profession, or trade, including, I might add, law, 
feels that government, through licensing and other forms of regulations, should protect their incomes from competition that would be caused by others entering the trade or profession. Now, conservatives, you know, if you ever see a group of conservatives arguing, you can bring instant peace and tranquility among conservatives. Just start talking about food stamps. Now, conservatives rail against food stamps. They rail against aid to families of dependent children. They rail against legal aid. But they come out in support for aid to dependent farmers, aid to dependent banks, and aid to dependent motorcycle companies. And as such, conservatives don't have a moral leg to stand on. That is, uh, uh, conservatives, as well as liberals, prove H.L. Mencken's definition of an election quite correct. Those of you who forget, H.L. Uh, Mencken was a political satirist for the Baltimore Sun. And somebody asked H.L. Mencken what was the definition of an election, and he said, quote, government is a broker in pillage, and every election is an advance auction on the sale of stolen property. That indicates the nature of our problem as, an, as, a, as a country, as a nation. That is, we have a political system whereby strong interest groups can use the coercive powers of the state in the pursuit of their own goals. Many times, the pursuit of, these own, of, their, of their own goals makes everybody else uh, worse off. So, let me close by kind of suggesting, because a lot of people say, Williams, you, you talked about the problem, but you haven't come up with any solutions. Well, that's not necessarily my job. But let me just talk about <laughs> some solutions anyway. Um, I think that it would be very interesting to get your, your opinion on it, particularly since you are fledgling scholars <coughs> in law. I think that right now the major problem with our country is that Congress has no bottom line. That is, Congress can do what a sufficiently uh, large enough or strong enough interest groups allow it to do, so far as economics is concerned. That is, there's nothing in the Constitution of the United States that I see that protects our economic liberties. That is, clearly, the framers of the Constitution, uh, through things like the First Amendment, uh, there are protections of our rights to free speech, rights to assembly, rights to worship. But there's nothing there that sets a limit on what Congress can do to our paycheck. But there are things that sets a limit to what Congress can do with respect to our speech. So what we need to do, we need to give Congress a bottom line. We need to restrain the power of Congress. Because uh, freedoms depend on our ability to restrain the government. So, so far as protecting our economic liberties, we need an amendment to the Constitution that will limit federal spending. And I've worked along with uh, my colleague Milton Friedman and a number of uh, very eminent uh, um, economists uh, some years ago, back in the late 70s, and some uh, uh, constitutional scholars like uh, uh, Bob Bork and, and, uh, and Posner and some other people. And we wrote the Spending Limitation Amendment to the United States Constitution. And what it did, it says that percentage increases in federal spending cannot exceed percentage increases in the GNP. That is, our political people told us that we could hold the line, but we could not cut back. And at that time, the federal government was 20% of the, uh, the GNP, 20, 21%. Well, and we had the, uh, you know, the appropriate uh, emergency clauses, and we had a supermajority to change it. And indeed, the so-called balanced budget spending limitation amendment passed the Senate in 1982, but Tip O'Neill played games with it in the House. Uh, and it didn't even get to the floor uh, in the House. And it was introduced and in, reintroduced in 1986, and it didn't even pass the uh, Senate. But as long as we don't have something that will give Congress a bottom line, limit the amount of spending that uh, Congress can do, Congress is going to increase spending. And as Congress increases spending, as I suggested earlier on, we have reduced uh, freedom. 
So let me just close by, by saying that one of the problems in our society is that we're not losing our freedom all at once. Or there's no major threat of our freedom no, in one big chunk. That is, we're losing it little bits at a time. You know, my colleague Leonard Reed, uh, the founder of uh, the Foundation for Economic Education in New York, he said that if you, want to know, if you want to take freedom away from Americans, you have to know how to cook a frog. And he says that you can't cook a frog by putting a pot of boiling water on the stove and then throwing the frog in the boiling water because he's, the frog's reflexes are so quick that as soon as his feet hit the water, he would be out of the pot and on his way towards freedom. He says the way that you cook a frog is to put a pot of cold water on the stove put the frog in the water, and then heat the water up bit by bit. And by the time the frog realized he was being cooked, it was too late. That's what's happening in our country. That is, nobody, Americans would, would uh, uh, rebel against any tyrant coming here, taking our freedoms all at once. But we're, we sit silently and watch them be being taken bit by bit. So our problem is that the Founding Fathers, although they produce a, a brilliant document, there's nothing in the document to protect that economic freedom. And as my friend uh, Richard Epstein uh, uh, suggested, as outside his office door, maybe the Founding Fathers would have uh, bequeathed us a better nation if they had stopped the Bill of Rights at its first sentence. That is, Congress shall make a law, no law. Uh, period. <laughs> and that's uh, Richard Epstein's version of the Constitution. Uh, well, that's all I have to say, and I'm willing to uh, answer any question or respond to. Uh,